In the second part of our unit of membranes and transport, we will talk about the proteins in the membrane and we will talk in more depth about the transport processes. To begin our discussion of membrane proteins, I want to start off as using an example of a protein that is important to all of us. And this is a protein called rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is the protein that allows us to see. It is a protein that is in the membrane of our uh, eye pigment cells, and it has seven transmembrane domains. Each transmembrane domain is an alpha helix, as you can see in these spirals here. And you should be able to see seven transmembrane domains. So the entire rhodopsin protein is a single polypeptide chain with seven transmembrane domains, and it goes in and across the membrane seven times. Rhodopsin is the light receptor, and when a photon excites the rhodopsin molecule, it transmits a signal to this other protein, which is a peripheral membrane protein. And this peripheral membrane protein associated with rhodopsin is called transducin. And it's a member of a family of proteins called G proteins. And rhodopsin is indeed a member of a family of proteins called G protein coupled receptors. Rhodopsin is a light receptor, and it is coupled with a special G protein called transducin. G protein has three different polypeptide chains that assemble together to make this quaternary structure. And even though this is a peripheral membrane protein, so none of this pro the G protein is actually embedded within the lipid bilayer, it hangs out in the periphery of the membrane through these tethers that link it to the membrane phospholipids. Membrane proteins have lots of functions. Rhodopsin is a sensor, and you can rhodopsin and other proteins are involved in cell signaling, receiving signals from outside the cell. Other proteins have an important role in cell adhesion, ad adhesion of a cell to surfaces or adhesion of cells to other cells. And those adhesion events are really specific. And so we can add cell-to-cell -cell recognition to this. Other proteins are involved in cell movement. For example, the bacterial flagellum um, and in eukaryotic cells, cilia are anchored to integral membrane proteins. And as we will see later on um, in subsequent lectures, Membrane proteins play a key role in energy metabolism. Essential reactions in respiration and photosynthesis occur on membranes and are carried out by membrane proteins. Finally, membrane proteins are important for the st stabilizing the structure and shape of a cell. And finally, well, again, um, and what we'll explore next is the role membrane proteins play in transport of materials across cell membranes. In discussing transport, I want to start off with osmosis. Osmosis is essentially a special case of diffusion. So this picture here at the top shows diffusion of molecules across a semi-permeable membrane. The red dots, you can imagine, are solute molecules. And as you can see, on the left side, we have 
a high concentration of solute molecules, and on the right side we have a low concentration. What will happen if the membrane is permeable to the solute molecules is that some of these solute molecules will cross the membrane. And some of these solute molecules will cross the membrane from right to left as well. But since there are many more molecules on the left side than on the right side, there will be more molecules going from left to right than there will be molecules going from right to left. And over time, what will happen is that the concentrations will equalize until the number of molecules going from left to right exactly equals the number of molecules from going from right to left. And at that point, we have attained equilibrium. So at equilibrium, it's not static. Molecules are still crossing the membrane, but the rate of molecules crossing the membrane is equal in both directions. So that is diffusion. What is osmosis? Well, let us suppose that the semi-permeable membrane is in fact not permeable to the solute molecules. So the solute molecules can't cross the membrane. So what happens? Well, this is still a non-equilibrium situation here to have a high concentration on one side and a low concentration on the other. Well, the solution is that if the solute molecules can't cross the membrane, well, the water molecules themselves can cross the membrane. So if water molecules go from right to left, then the concentration of solute molecules on the left will decrease because we'll have more water. So the movement of water molecules in an attempt to equalize the concentration of solutes on either side of a semi-permeable membrane then is what we call osmosis. Osmosis important, is important physiologically. Our cells like to be in what we call an isotonic situation meaning that the concentration of solute molecules outside our cells is roughly equal to the concentration of solute molecules inside our cells. So in this balanced situation, the movement of water into and out of the cells is balanced, and our cells maintain a nice, happy situation. Okay. However, if our cells are placed in a high salt solution, like, let's say, seawater, now the concentration of salts and other molecules outside the cell is much higher than inside the cell. What then happens is that water leaves our cells, and as a result, our cells shrivel up. They decrease in volume and shrivel up, okay, which is not a good situation. It's even worse if our cells are put in a hypotonic solution, meaning that the concentration of uh, solute molecules outside the cell is much lower than the concentration inside our cell. Let's say we put our cells in plain distilled water. At that point, the water will now rush into our cells, trying to lower the concentration of solutes inside our cell. As a result, our cells will swell up and because we don't have anything to confine our cell membranes, like the plant cell walls, our cells will actually uh, burst once they have taken in enough water. Now you may ask how water crosses the cell membrane. After all, water is a hydrophilic molecule. And it, it is polar, um, so water is polar, whereas the, the core of the lipid bilayer membrane with all those hydrophobic tails is extremely hydrophobic. The main way that water crosses cell membranes is through specialized proteins called aquaporins. As their name implies, they form a channel for water, a water channel, aquaporin. They're ubiquitous. They're found in all domains of life. Basically, all cells have aquaporins that permits osmosis of water across the cell membrane. Now, water molecules can 
cross uh, lipid bilayer membranes, but very slowly, and they have a hard time doing it. So to get water transport across cell membranes at significant, at useful rates, um, you need aquaporins. Aquaporins assemble in the lipid bilayer membrane as a tetramer. There are four identical polypeptides that assemble in the plane of the membrane as a tetramer. So shown here is a top-down view. And each polypeptide chain of the tetramer is shown in a different color. And these little yellow blobs are the actual water channels uh, within each monomer. These channels can be gated, meaning that they open or shut in response to cellular signals. And some tetramers form a channel in the middle, you know, that would be a fifth channel, that allows the passage of other molecules. And this here is a side view uh, cut away in the plane of the lipid bilayer, again showing the water channels and the central channel uh, going all the way across the lipid bilayer. This is a molecular animation of an aquaporin. You can see the little cute red and white water molecules. And here you can see the channel, the water molecules going down the channel. This yellow blob, this yellow molecule here in the middle is a molecule of glycerol that happens to fit this particular aquaporin. When we consider transport of other materials across cell membranes, meaning uh, not water, we can categorize them into three fundamental categories. The first category is simple diffusion. This is movement of materials across the lipid bilayer. These are small, uncharged, hydrophobic molecules. Hydrophobic. They are able to diffuse right through the lipid bilayer itself. Examples are oxygen gas, okay, carbon dioxide, ethylene, and steroid hormones. Steroid hormones are lipids that are lipid soluble and therefore they can cross a lipid bilayer membrane. Facilitated diffusion has transport proteins. And these transport pro proteins form channels or pores or act as carriers. They're highly specific, meaning they don't a law passage of just any old molecule, but they're very choosy about which molecules um, they uh, transport or a law to cross. And facilitated means that they do not use any energy. They simply a law passage of molecules down concentration gradient. Meaning that a molecule that has higher concentration outside its cell than inside will come into the cell when the gate is opened. Conversely, if the concentration of the molecule is higher inside the cell, then outside, and the gate opens, now the molecule will exit the cell. Active transport is carried out by proteins, again, it's highly specific, 
uses proteins and uses energy to transport against or uphill with respect to the concentration gradient. For instance, the phosphate concentration outside the cell in the environment is usually much lower than the phosphate concentration inside the cell. Nevertheless, cells have phosphate transporters which will expend energy from ATP to still continue to bring in phosphate molecules from outside the cell into the cell against the concentration gradient. Lastly, I want to use this plot to illustrate that facilitated diffusion and active transport show saturation kinetics. Saturation kinetics involve any reaction that involves a limited number of proteins. In this case, both facilitated diffusion and active transport require or are mediated by a limited number of proteins in the cell membrane. So let's start off by contrasting it against sort of our baseline, which is simple diffusion. And let's use our example, simple diffusion of oxygen. The kinetics of oxygen transport into the cell will be basically a straight line, meaning that if the concentration of oxygen inside the cell is the same as the concentration of oxygen outside the cell, so the concentration difference is zero, then there is no net transport of oxygen. If the concentration of oxygen outside the cell is higher, so you, get a, uh, you have a concentration difference, then oxygen will come into the cell. And the rate of oxygen transport into the cell, or oxygen diffusion into the cell, will simply be proportional to the difference in oxygen concentration across the membrane. And it's a linear relationship. Contrast that with chloride transport. Chloride transport shows facilitated diffusion kinetics so that, again, as the concentration difference across the membrane increases, the rate of chloride transport increases. But here's what happens. As the concentration difference becomes really large, the rate plateaus. So why does it plateau? Well, in this region, what's happening is that every chloride transporter is as busy as it can be. This is analogous to a situation where you have a horde of people trying to get into a football stadium. If you have relatively few people trying to get in, you have a slower rate. The more people you have trying to get in, through turnstiles, you get faster and faster. But at some point, you can imagine that all the turnstiles are being rotated as fast as they can. So even as the numbers of people outside, uh, even as the crowd outside gets bigger and bigger, there is no increase in the numbers of people moving through the turnstiles because all the turnstiles are fully occupied. And this is the same situation when a chloride transport plateaus, because now all the chloride channels are turning over as fast as they can. Active transport will show similar kinetics, saturation kinetics. The rate of active transport will again plateau when all the active transport proteins are working as fast as they can. The difference between active transport and facilitated diffusion is that active transport is able to still import materials into the cell 
even against the concentration gradient. When the concentration uh, difference is reversed, meaning there is more already more inside the cell than outside, it can still continue working using energy.